It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome back to Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. I am your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson. And our super producer, Riley Bray. Burning the candles at both ends tonight. <laughs> he's running backup all? recordings frontwards recordings this guy's working all the hard. recordings yeah he's working hard <laughs> to make us sound good all the recordings um well boys and girls we have a special treat i'm gonna let bryce introduce our guests in just a minute but this episode completes our expedition bigfoot season two trilogy uh of guests uh this has been such an awesome time to talk to bryce about the behind the scenes of the show and you know last week we had dr maria Mayer, and then before that we had mr uh ronnie leblanc um if you're interested over on the other side the patreon uh we have been recapping every single episode of this season of expedition bigfoot for even deeper dive looks into each episode every season so if you're interested subscribe to us patreon.com slash bigfoot collectors club and uh, we get even more into it. Uh, all right, Bryce, I think yeah. we'll hop right in. Uh, why don't you tell us who is rounding out the trifecta tonight? Let's do it. He's a bit of a rebel and a bunch of a badass. <laughs> a motorcycle enthusiast, army veteran, survivalist, hunter, tracker, researcher, author, and filmmaker, as well as the creator of the International Bigfoot Conference. Please welcome to the show, Expedition Bigfoot team member Russell Acord. All right. <laughs> yes. Wow. How, how, where do you go with that? That was that was impressive. I <laughs> I, I love the way that sounded. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'll send you that uh, so you can have that up for your own. I got it. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to it in the morning when you wake up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's your new alarm. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. welcome to the show uh thank you, thank if you. you'd been listening to our patreon episodes i'm constantly singing your praises about what a badass you are in our recap episodes i can't believe you're doing some of the things that you're doing on the show uh like oh there's a sound i'm going after that or here's a cave i'm going down in that <laughs> like <laughs> i think i texted bryce last uh, uh on sunday night i was like there is no fucking way you would get me in a cave that's where i would draw the line <laughs> Uh, you're a very impressive guy, uh, and we're going to get into uh, your background because uh, we have lots of questions for you. Fantastic. Uh, before we do that, though, Riley, here's a quick heads up. Bryce, and I'm going to be very interested to hear Russell's opinion on this. I think this is a story well suited for him. Uh, we have a little bit of... BCC News! News. <laughs> All right. We have a story that was sent in by multiple listeners. This is probably a story that we got sent to us more than any other story uh, in recent months. Yeah. Russell, I'm sure you've heard of this. Uh, uh, Riley, I'm curious. Uh, Bryce, we've already talked about it a little bit. Uh, but they there's a team of scientists that thinks they might have figured out what happened at Dyatlov Pass uh, over half a century ago. Yeah. Um, this is Whoa. from National Geographic. Has science solved one of history's greatest adventure mysteries? A 62-year-old adventure mystery that has prompted conspiracy theories ab ab around Soviet military experiments, yetis, and even extraterrestrial contact may have its best, most sensible explanation yet, one found in a series of avalanche simulations based in part on car crash experiments and animation used in the movie Frozen. Well, that's a perfect sound cue, too. <laughs> I really hope that was Russell. No, that was me. I was ready for that. I thought someone's... <laughs> that's amazing. Bryce, nice, why don't you nice. remind everybody what, uh, briefly, what the Dyatlov Pass uh, incident was? 
Yeah, right. So nine hikers uh, in, I think it was January of 59, hiked up into the Ural Mountains. Now, these were seasoned hikers, and uh, and they all perished in a, in a strange and odd way. But I want to get into this article uh, just in a little bit. You know, as Michael was saying, uh, they ran some computer simulation models, uh, <laughs> basically from the movie Frozen. Um, well, no, goes- what they did was they they built a computer simulation uh, trying to figure out, trying to prove that this was actually an avalanche that caused the death of all these hikers yes. and a delayed avalanche. They thought, well, because there was no snow that night, that there could have been what they called a, 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 a what is it like a, a not a miniature avalanche, but it's basically the new theory is that uh, a, a sheet or a big block of ice of avalanche about the size of an SUV was delayed uh, after an earthquake, ran down the hillside and basically perfectly crushed the campsite that they were in. Um, right. And this was caused by there wasn't any snow, but they thought there were there are records of the winds being really bad that night. So they thought maybe the winds had carried the snow to this uh, to the towards the top of the mountain basically creating a perfect storm for this to happen and how they did it was they they were this is like a team of russian and i think swiss or maybe i think swiss scientists yes and one, two things that they did to collect this data is they ran a snow simulation where they visited disney animation and when you guys created snow so great in frozen how did you do that the animators showed <laughs> they're them like, now we want you to crush people <laughs> right right <laughs> so they they changed the code of the animation algorithm for snow and then using gm research from the 1970s on car crash dummies right. basically created a model to kill <laughs> simulated humans with the snow animation from frozen right you know what's so funny about this is they're like they're like using data to try and like stick it into their hypothesis they're like we're going with this avalanche thing and we're gonna fucking make it stick you know so uh the researchers computers modeled uh, a 16 foot long block of hefty snow that could in this quote unique situation handily break the ribs and skulls of the people sleeping on a rigid bed Woo! problem solved (laughs) <laughs> not for me, not for fucking me, because listen, that doesn't explain the orange orbs. OK, that doesn't explain the diary of one um, of one of the girls who wrote from now on. We know that the snowman exists. Right. Don't even get me started on the on the photograph of the the large hairy beast with huge arms peeking out behind the trees. Okay, um, Harry's a stretch. It still could be a big man in the snowsuit. Hey, I've looked at that thing. That That is a Russian mank. Well, I, I want to kick it over to Russell. Russell, you must be familiar with this case, and I'm curious if you read this story. Help us fight science, Russell. Why is this wrong? <laughs> I think sadly, I'm on the side I, of science. Sadly, I, this is the first I'm hearing of it. I don't I do not do as, as uh, deep diving into the the articles as you do. I'm, basically, I the... I'm looking forward and the people that are bringing, you know, testimonies now are the ones that I'm actually getting wind of the thing from the past. Let me tell you that there's no way I could actually hear that story and think, no, no, no. Um, There's more to it than uh, snow flurries and the perfect storm of, of that. It just doesn't feel right. Anybody else get that sensation that that is, that it's a, there's more to it than just a weather system that came in and took these guys out. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, you know, all these people, they left their tent in the, in in the middle of the night in a panic. Some of them started immediately undressing. Um, You know, they found two of them by a campfire. One was, one was climbed up a tree. Um, You know, they, they did an investigation and some of these injuries that these people sustained, I remember one guy described it as being like almost crushed by like a hug like thing. Russell, I just sent you the picture of that. uh, I just saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the last photographs taken (laughs) on one of these hikers cameras. And if you zoom in on that, man, I mean, you know, it just looks like, you know, what the local Manzi tribe described as, you know, the snowman, this creature that had a Tate, you know, is known to the area. And, uh, and I don't know. I think it's just a little convenient. I think they're really just trying to ram this avalanche theory down our throats. And hey, it may be, maybe that's what happened. But 
you know, I know these people saw orbs, strange lights in the skies. They took pictures of them. I, um, I don't think anyone's trying to ram an avalanche story down your throat. I think that these are <laughs> scientists that are trying to figure out what happened because it still remains a mystery. And right. they do say it doesn't answer all of the questions, but basically they've figured out, you know, the official explanation by the Russian government was it was an avalanche and they're not saying anything else about it. Right. right. So they're playing with that method. They're trying to see if that could be possible. Yeah. And the sure. simulation at least shows, OK, there was a way that there could be an avalanche. You know, yeah. the, it says the article says most of the nine who perished died of hypothermia, while others may have succumbed to their injuries. Uh, you know, the undress of some found in remains is puzzling, although paradoxical undressing may be an explanation that happens during hypothermia. Um, and then the, there are reports that some of the bodies had traces of radioactivity, which may have been a result of uh, thorium present in camping lanterns. That seems like a stretch to me. Uh, and then the missing eyes and tongues of victims may have simply been a result of scavenging animals pecking yeah. at the dead. But that, too, remains an open question. So it doesn't solve everything. I think the, the cool thing here is that people built a, a, a simulation to kill people with s snow from frozen <laughs> that that to me is the story which well, is on that note uh, just there's definitely a giggle factor about the the frozen uh s snow engine but that uh the physics engine that they made for that movie was is like one of the most advanced uh modeling uh engines like of its time and still to date it's so it's like it's actually really advanced computing what they put together sure. to to render the snow in Frozen. So it's it's funny that this thing that was used for a children's movie is actually like an incredibly powerful yeah. physics engine. It's oh. fucking Disney, man. They don't joke around when it comes to animation, okay? This is why <laughs> yeah. I'm a die, uh, diehard, lifelong fan of Disney. I've got some Bigfoot models I would have been happy to lend out. <laughs> Russell, you said, uh, you said, you, uh, what do you think of this photo? You said, you just texted me, I'm going to kill this photo. Hope you don't mind. What are you thinking about this <laughs> yes. photo here? All right, so um, this probably won't make me popular with, with anybody who actually um, is in love with the photo, but let's take a quick look at it. Zoom in on it closely, okay? Make it fill the whole screen. Yeah. Let's just take a look at the anatomy of this thing, okay? Right in the right around the midsection, there is a, a color change or almost a band around the center of this thing, which could be um, that first thing is – if like any other animal, deer, elk, bear, they're going to be consistent from top to bottom, and there's no band in the center of the body, number one. But number two, if you look at the build of this thing, if I'm a Bigfoot and I'm surviving off the, the land, I'm not going to have what looks like a truck driver's beer belly going on here, but he looks a little <laughs> thick around the stomach section. That's a vodka belly. That is a <laughs> Russian <Yeah>. vodka belly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, generally, I've never seen. Uh, you always hear about the uh, the br humongous broad shoulders of of the testimonies, and this thing has broad shoulders, but the they're equally as massive as the center of the body. So it's it's hard to take that picture and say that we have. Um, boy, I really hate to poo poo on your picture, but it's hard to. <laughs> Hard yeah, I don't, but I don't like where this is going at all. Let's let's I'm move on from this. I'm loving every minute. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, but but I, you know me, I've I've always been really really logic based, and if I if I can't be sold on the picture, totally. um, I would rather say I don't understand it, and 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 I'm happy with that. No, but it's very know. it's very true. It's very true. I think even the article states, you know, it sometimes it might just be too normal of a uh, of an ex explanation for some and I I they I think they might be talking about me. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. for now, I'm going to stick with my Russian mank theory uh and the in the orange orbs. But you're right, I've never looked at the photo like that, but maybe perhaps Russell a pregnant Bigfoot or maybe a a Bigfoot that's been avoiding the gym. <laughs> <laughs> well yes yeah, a bigfoot in a pan pandemic um that, well, i will throw that photo up on the uh on the instagram so you can take a look for yourself but i very much enjoyed that russell we like to ask all of our guests who come on the show what is your personal paranormal history this could in involve obviously bigfoot ghosts ufos anything basically how did you get into uh, searching for Bigfoot, and do you have any scary stories? Wow. Um, so uh, for me, the same thing that I think grabbed everyone's attention was the 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film. Um, my dad actually took us to the uh, 
um, a theater the, no way. way back in the day where I actually went to a movie theater and watched the uh, the show, the Patterson Gimlin film, and they showed the skull and they had the howl and they, you know, that kind of thing. And that, it was from that moment on, I thought, well, if there's something out there, I there's going to be one in every neck of the woods. So I'm going to find my own. So I, the search was on for me. I started searching wow. at that point. And where did you grow well, up? Uh, well, I, I born in Baltimore, raised in West Virginia, um, through my, before I got into school, I think I had, uh, up to first, second and third grade in West Virginia. And then the rest of it was all Montana. Wow. Everything Montana. So I was in the backwoods of West Virginia looking for Bigfoot. Um, and there are two things that stand out in my mind when you ask about paranormal. I'll give you two real quick stories I'll, I'll, and try to stay awake through both of them if you guys don't mind. No, please. When I, <laughs> when I was in West Virginia, um, I was the kid that um, the parents didn't worry about me. I mean, we had black bears and rattlesnakes and everything, copperheads. And I would go out the back door and I would just be gone the whole day. I was turning over leaves and lifting chunks of wood and we had hundreds of acres behind our house. Wow. And I would, that was, that was my life was just, that was my playground. I had all the other siblings were in school and gone. I was there by myself and that was what I wanted to do. And it gave my mom a break every now and then I'd come back to the house and get some food and head right back out again. It was just, it was what I needed to stay healthy. I saw something and I, and I went back and I told my mom about it and she, her reaction, I remember her reaction was she was disturbed by the information that I gave her. I was on a, on a hillside, probably, I would say even today going back to white horse mountain, it was a, I was almost a mile from the house and granted I hadn't started school yet. So you're talking a five or six year old kid, man. Okay. <laughs> so and I had I had my dad's hunting knife, which today he still has, and it was probably as as from my pinky to my elbow is a big giant hunting knife that my uncle had made, and he let me carry that when I was out in the woods to protect myself. So here I was, this big badass hunter, at five years old. Wow! But I was about a mile away from the house on White Horse Mountain, and I something caught my eye because uh, something went between me and the sun. Mm. something circled between me and the sun. And I looked up and I saw um, one of the biggest spans of wingtip of a bird that I've awesome. ever seen in my life. Oh shit. Thunderbird. It was, it was so you got to remember here I am uh, just a kid looking at this wing think uh, So it could have been a, a, a goose, an eagle, uh, you know, a, a vulture or something like that. But from where I was standing, it was enormous, and it literally, um, as it circled, it the shadow came across me and blocked out the sun for that split second. And that's why I looked up, and I saw this this wing going away, and that was that was pretty exciting for me. It, it was exciting enough that I went back and I told my mom about it, and she she said, "Well, maybe you need to stay closer to the house because." <laughs> I'm sure she's picturing, you know, um, here's this little tiny scrawny Speaking kid up. in the woods and an eagle. I mean, you, I had no chance with even with my dad's big hunting knife. So it was just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, that was, that was really um, freaky for me. Um, Are you familiar with the idea of people seeing these, they call them thunderbirds, but these yeah. large, yeah. Just like you described, these birds that really aren't supposed to exist, and some would almost call them prehistoric, but but people, you know, all over the world have spotted them, and you know, if they exist or not, that remains to be seen. Right. So you got to. So for me, that was the largest thing I'd ever seen, and I and I remember telling her it was bigger than Dad. Wow. You know, this is big giant bird. So, but let's, <laughs> let's get some perspective here. Back then, a Big Mac took me two hands to pick up off the plate. You know? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So right now, it's, it's, uh, it's embarrassing to look at a Big Mac compared to what Man, they were years Big ago. Big Macs, <laughs> knives, walking around in the woods. You, so far, you've had my dream childhood. <laughs> <laughs> You're living it. Yeah. Oh, man, it was incredible. The other thing that got me was... Um, we were in uh, Montana. I was a sophomore or junior in high school. My sister and I 
Um, we lived, my dad always lived in the mountains. We, he was one of those off the grid kind of guys. So we were off of, uh, out of town, probably, I remember it was a four mile walk from our house to get down to where the mailbox was, where the school bus would come pick us up. So we were, I was probably another half mile to a mile away from the house beyond that, my sister and I, and we were looking, actually, I know we were looking at bear tracks and, um, we climbed up in this tree and we were looking over the ridge and listening to the traffic, you know, miles away and just talking our BS. And she got, she was looking over my shoulder and she got visibly upset over something. And uh, I turned around and there was these oh, picture, picture you go to the fair and you have two balloons that are tied together. You know, uh -huh. a kid with two balloons and it gets caught in the wind and they kind of dance around each other as they're going off in the distance. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, so she sees this thing maybe eight miles out on the next, um, it was across the valley, and it was above the next little range of, of mountains. So we're looking across this range at these two disks, and it, from where I was wow. sitting, it looked like that, the two little balloons that were just kind of dancing around each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my first logical mind says, well, it's just two balloons that are tied together. And, um, but from that far away, we'd have never seen them. I mean, these things were pretty good size from, you know, just even our own perspective. And I'm trying to wrap my head around that thinking it's just balloons. And they literally stopped dancing around each other. And they just went kind of went straight for just a short bit of time. Like they straightened out and were just kind of ramping up to go. Um, they went straight for just about a second or two. And then they shot off across the sky and disappeared out of sight in just maybe two seconds, two, three seconds. Balloons don't I've do that. I've never seen anything cover that much airspace. No airplanes could have moved that fast. Wow. <clears throat> and that was back in the, I'm, I'm dating myself here, but that was in 81, 82. And, and did you uh, know it at the time? Did you, were, I mean, or when did you might have realized or the words UFO pop into your mind about that situation? Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. In fact, my, my sister and I still talk about it and she, um, she's not able to wrap her head around that whole situation yet. You know, she said, do you, and she'll bring it up, you know, and you can tell in her face, she's still kind of awkward about it, but she'd say, you know, Hey, do you remember those two things that were moving around each other, in, you know, in the sky? And it's just kind of, yeah, I, I remember it clearly. Wow. And that was what, in Montana. Wow. What sound, what jumps out at me about that story and maybe I'm reading too deep into it is that the moment you thought, Oh, they're just balloons. They stopped, <laughs> you know, their behavior changed. Yeah. Which, and they just kind of went steady across the, you know, from right to left, just went steady for a little bit just for a short period of time. And then they, it, it's like they hit the, uh, the afterburner and just shot out across the sky. No sound, no nothing. They were just gone. Did you get a sense that they were aware of you guys? No, it was, it was quite some distance away from us, but they mm -hmm. were large enough to see, which is, which may, you know, the, they had some size to them. Mm. Wow. If you had a guess, mm -hmm. how much would you measure them at? Oh, seriously. I would say they were, uh, for us to see them, so think about the distance. They were across the valley and above the other mountain range, and that's a good span of 10 to 12 miles. So these things literally would have had to be as big as a two-story house mm. wow. for, us, wow. for us to see them that well. That's wild. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we're. I think we're in a we're in a day and age, and you know, maybe your sisters might not be aware of this, but it's like you know, with the release of those New York times articles and we're always talking about it, but it, it's starting to come more to the forefront. I mean, I think the, the taboo nature of the idea that there's, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena in the sky or UFOs, as we call them exist now and have existed for quite some time. And, and, and people have recorded them and documented them and it's not, you know, completely out of place to, to witness one of these things. No, I, I, you know, I don't, um, Ronnie is pretty heavily into that. I don't disc discard or discredit, you know, I am. And like I said, I'm, I'm pleased with the idea of not knowing what the, what is out there. Yeah. If there is or isn't something out there, I will tell you that um, my strongest belief is 
if we think that we're the only in, intelligent life form out in this entire universe, we're naive. It's just yeah. wouldn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, so that, that's pretty, I mean, you are, you're pretty much in that flesh and blood camp and you're very pragmatic. I think when it comes to a lot of these ideas and, and uh, that, that's why I think it's so fun to, to, to watch you on the show and, and, and sort of the role that you serve is, is this guy who's looking to represent the camp that these creatures exist. They're just not confirmed. They're not going in and out of portals. You know, they're not, you know, being beamed down from a spaceship, but these are, large possible primate creatures that are just completely elusive and intelligent. Would, does that sound about right? Yeah. I, I don't, I think my mind is based on ground floor. I think that they are flesh and blood like you and I, I can walk up and poke them, uh, stick them on the stick and they're going to bleed just like you and I do. Yeah. I, I have not bought into the, the thought that they are, um, they're, something else from, from outer space or something interdimensional else. or right. yeah and, and it, you know what? i i would love it if i found out later on that i was completely wrong about all that and they really are right and sure. i accept that you know i i accept either side of it but right now there's there's nothing that we can actually tie a bow around and say this is exactly how it is because neither one of us know I was just thinking, what about, I couldn't say the same for myself, right? If we're like, we confirmed it was just flesh and blood, I'd be like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> definitely true. That's it. <laughs> Bryce, it oh turns out that Bigfoot is just a small avalanche. That's <laughs> all he is. Never. <laughs> but he works out. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. <laughs> Russell, so I want to go back to uh, your your kid. You go. I love that you saw Patterson Gimlin film, one of those road shows, because I've read about that, and I've always wondered what that was like. I mean, yeah. how many people? If you can, can you remember, like how many people were there? Or how exciting was the buzz around that at the time? Well, and to oh, add well, to those questions, was so it was it the main attraction? And 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 what did your dad think of it as well? Sorry. He. <laughs> so you're talking about when I watched the uh, the movie. Um, uh, I remember the theater was full, but I mean, you're, you're talking back in, uh, wow, Romney, West Virginia. And it was, um, you know, your typical small, dusty, uh, moldy smelling theater. Uh, but it was full. There, mm-hmm. there was a packed house, watched it. And all I remember, I don't remember really much about anybody else's reaction. I think I would have loved to have seen what I looked like walking out of that theater because my mouth was hanging open and my eyes were wide. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I, mm-hmm. I, there's something wow. out there. So, I mean, you gotta, I, I was young. I was young, just a kid. Sure. That's, I mean, that's, you're probably about the age, you know, Bryce and I were and Riley as well. Like when this stuff gets your hooks in you, you know what I mean? For us, it was, you know, uh, it would, oh God, I would have loved if it was the Patterson Gimlin film, but it was books that had photos of that in my, you know, public, uh, or my school library. So, yeah. You know, you find this stuff and it finds you. When did you then go? When was your first time going? Okay, I'm going out to to actually look for this thing. Day one, like I said, <laughs> we lived out in, in, the, in the woods. Right. Fair enough. I mean, you know, I took Dad's big old honking hunk knife, and you know, straight out the back door I went, and that, you know, Mom, bye. <laughs> when do you feel like you were no longer in the backyard as a kid and you were like okay now i'm really like was it expedition bigfoot was it before that where you're like okay cool this is like official now you know or has it always been that felt that way to you no years 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 before expedition bigfoot ever started i i was uh i've been uh i had an experience in montana um quite a few years back where i saw something and i and i actually thought that i was seeing it but without backup, without actually seeing footprints and, and that sort of thing, I refuse to call it a Bigfoot sighting. Mm. I mean, I'm not, when I say that I've seen a Bigfoot, I'm going to have more than just a, t- a story to talk about. I will have, you know, a lot more backup than that. And I, because I, I hear so many stories and you, you know, these, not all these thousands of people can be crazy. These people are actually seeing something. Right. Yeah. And I want to be able to validate what they're seeing and be able to say, you know what? I have my own Bigfoot story. Here are the footprints. Here are the snapshots. And here's the hair sample. This is uncontested. This is why I'm going to tell you that this is what I saw because I can back every piece of it up. But the stories that I'm hearing are incredible. But I, I'm i the type that I want more than just a sighting and somebody to 
to uh, kind of explain to me what they saw, I, I, I demand, just like anybody else, we demand proof. That's the only way we're going to put this thing to rest and validate everything that everyone else has seen and is talking about. Hmm. Russell, why do you think proof eludes us, or at least you guys who are actually searching for this? Because, and we're going to, in the second half of the show here in a few minutes, I'm going to tell a story. Um, and and it's the kind of story that when you hear it, you're like, well, why? Okay, if this happened to these people, why can't it happen? Why can't we get the proof? You know what I mean? Because these people had a whole encounter with this thing. You know, what, what's, why, why is it so hard to get that proof? Do you think? I have a pretty good theory on that. Um, so you have uh, mom, dad, kids, they have a sighting. Okay. Something is, is they, and they all witness it. Okay. They see something that just scares the crap out of them. The first thing as a dad I'm thinking of is, okay, the size, of this thing, the, the, you know, what I'm looking at, I'm thinking, okay, I have a wife and two children sitting here or one child or, or a wife or just one, whatever you have. You're thinking, okay, I don't want to subject them to the threat if there's a threat available. I don't, I don't want to put my family in danger. So basically, the first thought is a lot of these people will say, I saw something and it scared the crap out of me. You always yeah. hear, that. you know, it scared me so bad. I just had to get out of there. Well, that's not the kind of guy that's going to say, okay, kids, mom, you guys sit in the truck. I'm going to grab my tweezers and some collection kit, and I'm going to go out in the woods and see if I can find footprints where we just saw this thing and, and start collecting and kind of go after it and do the methodical, you know, follow-up. So I think that's what happens. It, it, when you have a sighting like that, often, I would say that oftentimes these guys are caught off guard. They mm -hmm. don't, um, they weren't expecting it, weren't prepared. And, uh, and Bryce, you know this, uh, uh, so many of the people that talk to us haven't, it, it just caught them off guard. How yeah. do you respond to that when you, you actually feel like you could really be putting yourself in a compromising position? Yeah, no, uh, no doubt. I mean, I think everyone I've spoken to has, has it, at least sort of had a sense of dread about their experience about it. I mean, obviously if, you know, if these creatures do exist, the way people are reporting them, I mean, they're, they're ominous, they're large and they're nothing to be fucked with, you know? Um, but then there are those people who run in after it, like, like you and, and Ronnie there, I, I forgot to, I was going to mention it to Ronnie, but I showed my son the movie predator, uh, for the first night, uh, like a week ago. And then when, when the character Mac runs after the predator into the forest, I was like, God, go get him. Look at that. He's like, that was like when Ronnie ran after the Bigfoot. And I was like, Yes. Yes, that's exactly what that's like. <laughs> but he compared it to the when Ronnie charged after that, uh, after whatever it was in over the ridge. But um, I don't know where I'm going with that. But, you know, I just love the idea that, uh, you know, there are those of us out there that are, you know, I don't include myself, but uh, sometimes I can. But who are actually, you know, charging ahead and trying to get to get proof of these things. Um and yet it still sort of eludes us in a way, although I'll, although I'll admit, I think this season we, we got closer than ever. I mean, the amount of activity is just off the charts. I have, huh. a, I have a question for you, Russell, about that. Um, and spoiler territory for the first five episodes of Expedition Bigfoot for people listening at home. Um, what is the, okay, we're five episodes in, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head where we've left off. You're about to go down into the cave uh, yeah. when we've last seen you on the show that you discover so far uh, into the season. What is the biggest piece of evidence for you that's like, OK, I'm on to something. I mean, we saw the teaser of the footprint at the very beginning of the season. We've seen some awesome thermal stuff. We've heard some great vocalizations. Um, what's the thing for you that goes, okay, we're on to something here. Um, listen to that howl again. Yeah. You know, that was, um, that was out of place. It wasn't a natural coyote sound. It wasn't something that we'd been hearing. It was really in standing there. It's hard to, to catch that audio from just the show and listen to it being played back. Standing in the woods, the volume of that thing and the fact that Maria and Ronnie were so far away from me and they still heard it the same volume and the same full 
tone. Mm-hmm. Um, that audio was pretty impressive. And as you will see later on in the season, um, there was there were a couple things that we collected along the way that uh, certainly got my attention. Mm. You know, and I'll, Michael mentioned the footprint, which we see in the teaser. And, and one thing which I think, you know, to, to throw a compliment your way, Russell, but it, it, it's you out there and even in season one who who grabs that thermal and who who finds this this trackway uh, in the in the second season. But I think there's something to be said for for you knowing these woods better than anybody or at least knowing how to navigate through these environments better than any of us. And and I think that's why you more than all of us seem to get so close, you know. Can you speak to that? Or, I mean, it's, I don't, if you notice, (laughs) poor Zach, I I love my cameraman. My cameraman, Zach, is probably uh, more of a badass than I am. And I would never admit that. So if he hears this, um, oh, he'll be pleased. (laughs) It's deniable. It's deniable. It didn't happen. Um, No, that guy, he goes everywhere I go and then some. But the thing is, is, and he will tell you this if you ever get a chance to talk to him. I don't stop moving. I am on the move all the time mm. and I have to cover ground. And for me, I know it's, you know, when we get into these spaces, we know that we only have so many days. Yeah. And for me, it's about covering as much acreage and my backpack is always swinging. My feet are always moving and I am just dissecting everything with my, you know, visually just looking, listening, smelling, feeling the texture of everything that I come in contact with. Yeah. And I, I can't sit still. And that's absolutely my nature. You're not playing around. I mean, and that's, I think that's one thing that the audiences just love about you. And more than anyone else, Michael, I don't know if you've noticed this too, but I've been so impressed how like Russell could be traipsing through the woods and then find hair. You know, he doesn't miss a fucking thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I'm going to check this bird's nest. There's probably a hair in here. Or you'll be passing by some trees and you'll, and you'll find a hair out of nowhere. And it just... It, it amazes me how, how you are so in that environment and able to spot an anomaly or something that you're looking for. You know, it's a real that, skill. That's standard or that's just good, typical. There's two things that have actually really helped me with my research. And like you're talking about seeing um, things that normally um, you would just walk by. But two things have put me in that mindset. Number one is my military career. When you're in the military and you are on foreign soil, your eyes don't miss anything. Mm, You can't afford to miss even the slightest um, inconsistencies in the terrain, the ground, the the landscape. And the same goes with when I grew up in Montana, we had a family of seven children, two parents. I was the hunter in the family. (laughs) I hunted and it was deer and elk and bear for me. And if I didn't bag my game, but during a hunting season, it was less food in the freezer, less food on the table. Wow. So I never, we never, I, I never failed them. Wow. That was my role. So you don't miss those things of disturbed soil or a sound in the wilderness of a deer moving, you know, to get out of your way. Um, you just don't miss any of those details. It's necessary. Do you feel, do you feel like you mentioned like, you know, um, being on foreign soil, does it feel like when you're on, on an expedition, like in East, Eastern Kentucky, do you feel like you're in foreign lands when you're going through there? Do you feel like you're in someone else's territory? No, the the weirdest Mm -hmm. thing is, and I'm going to tell you, Kentucky was probably the most unforgiving, hot, sweaty, tick infested, trigger biting down your legs, um, thunderstorms at the drop of a hat. It was it was rough, but it was absolutely at home. I, wow. when, when I'm when I'm there in that environment, um, everything else, th- nothing else matters really. I, I work out here on a professional job. I do. Uh, I mean, uh, my job requires me to have my head in the game, thinking, calculating, and cell phones and conference calls and Zoom meetings and all the silly regulations. But when I get out in the woods, all that stuff is where it's all stripped away and I can focus on what I absolutely love doing. So that is no matter where I'm at, if I'm researching, it's, it's never going to feel foreign soil to me ever. I don't, and I don't care what soil I'm on when it comes to that. 
You know, could, without having that that physical evidence that you were looking for when you 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 might have had that experience. I don't know if you've ever told me that, but can you walk us through what you what what you experienced in Montana, where you you think you might have run across this creature in some way? I was on. Okay, so do you remember how steep the terrain was in um, Kentucky? It was pretty much yeah. straight straight down. So there are mountains like that where you have a long span of a valley below with a creek that runs really hard through it and up the other side is steep and you're looking at rock slides on both sides so no matter where you're at you're looking at steep terrain rock slides dense forest but the span could be anywhere from a mile and a half to two miles from one you know as the crow flies from where my eyes are to the rock slide on the other side of the the the, the, the valley so if I'm looking at something a mile and a half away, you know that it's a good, tough walk to get down to the bottom right. and even more difficult to get back up the other side. And we're not talking the small hills in Kentucky. We're talking real like Alpine mountains. These are, it's, it's tough. Treacherous. So in Montana, I'm in the Bitterroot Valley and the, the, uh, the, hillside that I'm on, I was almost to the top. So it's a long ways. And it took me the better part of the day just to get up there. And that's normal for as high as those mountains are. And I look across and I see something on a rock slide. And I, at first I thought it was a bear. And it was, you got to understand, I'm, I came off the trailhead, which is probably seven, eight miles off the county road, you get to the trailhead. And then from the trailhead, I had gone back maybe five or six more miles. So I'm quite a ways away from where any vehicle would have been because I'm straight back in. Once you get back in, there's no roads. It goes for miles and miles into the cellway. So I'm uh, watching this thing traverse across these big giant rocks on a rock slide. And I even, I, I didn't have a... Um, binoculars so i took the bolt out of my weapon took the bullets out of it so that i just in case and i looked through my scope of my rifle mm. and i'm looking and it it looked exactly like a man in a ghillie suit oh. long oh. hair from i mean from uh, through, uh, throughout the face the wrists the elbows the back the front the everything all the way through the ankles and it was just kind of rolling it was really weird because it was very nimble as it as it rolled across these rocks and then it would disappear because it was down in the crevice and come back over the top of the the other ones and it went across this rock slide which was about 200 yards and then once it hit the tree line it never saw it again God. but i didn't hear a sound either and it was you know it was a long ways away a mile away but looking at this thing through the scope i don't like pointing my weapon at something but Having, I was just going to ask, yeah, what was the reasoning behind taking out the cartridge? Was that because it, it had a yeah, human-esque feeling to it? Well, no, you don't. Uh, I, you never point your weapon at something you're not willing to, to shoot. Yeah, yeah exactly. I realized that the optics that I needed to look through was attached to a weapon. And yeah. you don't point a weapon at another man. It, it would, unless, unless you're ready you to pull the trigger. Point. Yeah. Yeah. So I take, the, I take the cartridge out of it, and I literally slid the bolt completely out of it. So wow. there, was, there was just th – that way, all it was was just an extension of a – just a, a single monocular because it's, it's just ethics. You don't yeah. you don't point a weapon at a man no matter how far away he is. Let me ask you. Uh, did you get the feeling that this could have been a guy in a ghillie suit? That's – it's exactly what it looked like, and that's why it uh, – that's why I didn't take my eyes off of it. Yeah. Well, someone explain what a ghillie suit is. Sure. <laughs> is it just, okay. yeah. oh, it's a camouflage thing. Okay. It's okay. like once you see those snipers in, it's like a part yeah. of their environment. I mean, they, Russell, you you expl explain it a little bit uh, later on in the season, but uh, why don't you tell us, Russell, for those who don't know, what is a ghillie suit? A ghillie suit is made. It's uh, basically it's a uh, you get a so your BDU's battle dress uniform. What what an army guy wears when he's out in the field? Okay, mm -hmm. the camouflage pants and shirt. You take those and you take rubber cement and strands of burlap that are six to eight inches long, all the different colors, the browns, the greens, the blacks, everything else. And you literally just 
you glue it to this suit and you push on it and you grind it with dirt and then you put more layers over top of it to where this entire suit, it takes months to make a really good, solid ghillie suit because you canvas up the knees and the parts that would you'd be crawling across the ground with. But it's all, you glue this thing to this um, uniform that you wear. So it's, and it looks like just big, long strands of hair from head to toe. Got so it. that you can blend in with the forest. I've seen pictures of these. I just yeah. didn't know what they were called. They're so fun. That's a whimsical name. It sounds like something out of Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a creature from the Black Lagoon. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's the finished product. <laughs> that's an, I mean, so what was your conclusion uh, driving home or walking home after that incident? I would not have liked to see my face because I, I probably had that puzzled look on my face for days. Wow. Um, it was, it didn't, like I said, I was satisfied with not knowing exactly what it was. I was satisfied mm -hmm. with thinking, well, in the back of my mind, it could have been, mm -hmm. could have been, but then the other half of me thought, well, it could have been just a man in a ghillie suit trying out his gear out in the woods. But here's <laughs> exactly. the thing. Yeah. Why would I go so far back up in the mountains and climb all the way up that hill just to climb across a rock slide when they're down in the valley. And if you're going to climb across a rock slide in a ghillie suit, it's easier just to take it off and zip across his rock slide and put the ghillie suit back on. This thing was nimble. It was comfortable in its environment. The way it worked across that rock slide was really cool. What did, what did it do for your Bigfoot research? Did it fortify it? Did you double down? Were you like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm on, I, I'm going to keep pursuing this. I mean, how was the feeling of that when you, when you witnessed that? Um, it, when I saw that, because it was inconclusive, it was just really cool. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, I just looked at it and understood it as something that I didn't have backup evidence. I would literally have had to spend a day and a half to two days to get back up on the rock slide and see if I could find any hair or anything else. Hmm. And then to be able to traverse and find out exactly where that rock slide is from the other side, I did not have it. I was a working man, so I only had days to work with. Yeah. And I was hunting. I was, I was hunting. You know, wow. Russell, we've talked a little bit, uh, well, with, uh, with Maria and Ronnie as well. And I've, and I've given it some thought too, but I, I, I love asking, you know, what's your goal of Expedition Bigfoot? Like when, when we're out there in the field, what is your goal? Are, are you looking to see one of these things with your own eyes? Are you looking to bring back, uh, you know, in conclusive evidence? I mean, what is your personal goal on these expeditions? Um, to literally, <laughs> okay, Bryce, picture this. Here's my grand picture. Yeah. Russ, a cover of Time Magazine. <laughs> no, I'm, not. Right. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let's do it. Let's I'm, make it happen. I mean, if, as long as I'm in the background, I'm cool with that. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to give you man of the year already. <laughs> with um, the five year old with a knife. Yeah, yeah. You've got it. You've, 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 you've the captured the our hearts. I mean, come on. Year, yeah. <laughs> um, realistically, like I said earlier, um, when we started talking, I would love to be able to be that guy that says, here it is. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is absolute, uncontested, scientific, not an idea. This is proof, right. and that's what I would love to be the guy to to step forward with. Yeah, and, and I that, think that, sorry, go on, please. No, no, that would just be that's the cat's meow right there. I, I was just gonna say, I think you're in the running. I really do. I think you might, be, you guys might be at the head of the head of the race right now. Um, Russell, I have so much respect for you, uh, listening to you talk, and I'm worried that you will have no respect for me after we play this game. Um, <laughs> it almost, <laughs> Maria almost broke it last week. So we're going to see how this goes. Uh, we have a game that we love to play with everybody that comes on the show. I'm going to go down a list of phenomena. You oh, have, wow. uh, two choices. Now look, they're both extreme. And even if you're somewhere in the middle, you have to pick which side you fall on. Uh, you know, even if you're not 100% there either way. Russell's an uh, extreme guy. He can handle this. All right. Yeah. All right. All, right. All right. One more time. Throw me the rules one more time. Just let me, okay. me process this. I'm going to go down a list of phenomena. After okay. each one, if you're open to it, you're going to say, believe it. If you're not open to it, you're going to say, bullshit. This is a game that we like to play called... <laughs> 
bullshit or believe it? Oh my. All right, Russell. On your mark, get set. Ghosts. Believe it. UFOs. Believe it. Bigfoot. Believe it. ESP. Believe it. Shadow people. Bullshit. Unicorns. Totally bullshit. Alien abductions. Believe it. Yeti. Believe it. Mothman. Believe it. Out of body experiences. Believe it. Tarot cards. Bullshit. Demonically possessed dolls. <laughs> bullshit. The healing power of crystals. Believe it. An alien spacecraft crashed at Roswell. Believe it. Loch Ness Monster. Believe it. Atlantis. Boy, I... Damn it, I have to choose, don't I? That's so wrong. Um, Believe it. <laughs> Haunted Houses. Believe it. The Jersey Devil. Believe it. The Biblical Devil. Oh, I was married to her. Believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking hey. to the dead. <laughs> oh, shoot. Believe it. Mermaids. <laughs> Bullshit. The government is hiding the truth about Sasquatch. Believe it. Past lives. Believe it. Life on other planets. Absolutely believe it. Life after death. Believe it. Wow, dude. Wow, that, was that was great. Amazing. Crush, I, I thought we were on the level yeah, together on that one. I feel one. like I really know you now. Uh, oh. Is there any <laughs> anyone you want to go back and just disclaimer on? Uh, we could run through the list and I can throw you the disclaimers. Quickly. <laughs> well, you know, what surprised me was you said yes to Mothman. Are you, so you know of the Mothman, uh, history oh, yeah. and, and you're open to it. Yeah. it, it was, you too, know. Many, too many people saw it. Yeah. And, and it's just, uh, do you know who Lyle Blackburn is? Yeah. Lyle Blackburn, Ken Gearhart, these guys, um, listening to them, talking to them and what I knew long before I ever met them and just kind of those guys dig, dive deep. I mean, yeah. they, they are true state of the art researchers that don't back down. Um, the Mothman for some reason has always had my attention because long before this whole, uh, uh, CGI, people were seeing something yeah. that just completely did not make sense. I have to apologize to our listeners and to Russell, because I left out a very important character that I eliminated from last week's list because of the show. I got to ask you one more bullshit or believe it, Russell oh, skunk no. ape. Believe it. Great. I figured. Good. All right. Good. I love this. We have to take a break and we got to come back and we have a fun bedtime story for everybody uh, with this week's story of high strangeness. We'll be right back with Russell Acord. All right, we're back with this week's story of high strangeness. It's my turn. I picked out a story that I thought was very appropriate for tonight's uh, guest. Uh, Russell, let me know if you've heard this one. This took place in Canada back in 1941. It involves a Bigfoot. This is the Ruby Creek Incident. Oh, wow. Sounds familiar. Go on. Well, it's going to touch upon a lot of the things that we discussed tonight. Nice. This story takes place in Ruby Creek, British Columbia, back in 1941, before the term Bigfoot entered the American lexicon. The Chapmans, a First Nations family, lived in the small town of Ruby Creek along the Fraser River, about 30 miles north of Agassiz, British Columbia. The family was made up of George Chapman, his wife Jeannie, and their three children. The eldest son was nine, the middle child, another boy, was seven, and their youngest, a girl, was five. It was a crisp blue sky day in September of 1941. Jeannie was tending to the family's quaint home, which was nestled on the outskirts of town in a rural area alongside the railroad tracks. 
George was off at work for the day. He worked for the railroad. So Jeannie was at, was left at home with the kids who were all playing outside. Uh, you know, I don't think any of them were five miles away armed with a knife, but, uh, you know, <laughs> they sort of had that uh, free roaming uh, childhood. I think I think at one point the furthest away was a uh, was a half mile away. Uh, but uh, around 3 p.m., Jeannie's eldest boy came running into the house and proclaimed that a cow was emerging from the forest at the base of the mountainside. Jeannie's two youngest kids were still outside, so she decided to investigate. When her son led her to the spot where he'd seen the cow, Jeannie spotted what she thought at first was a large bear moving around in the brush in the field on the other side of the railroad tracks. She rounded up the kids and watched in terror as the bear walked out onto the tracks on two legs and revealed itself to be a quote-unquote gigantic man covered in hair. Years later, the Chapmans described their encounter to researcher Ivan T. Sanderson for the March 1960 issue of True Magazine, and most of the information that follows comes from that article. Jeannie said the creature was about seven and a half feet to ten feet tall, measuring against a fence line running along the field. It was covered in yellow-brown hair. It had a short head, no neck, or at the very least a very thick one that immediately merged with its shoulders. Its shoulders were wide, and it was thick in the chest. Its hair covered its genitals, but the creature did not have the same assets as Patty from the famous Patterson-Gimlin film of 1961, i.e. no pendulous breasts. Mm -hmm. So noting the lack of the female anatomy, Jeannie concluded that this specimen was a male. Its body was mostly human-shaped, with the exception of long arms. Its feet were covered by the tall grass, so she couldn't get a good look at those. The exposed areas of skin around its face and hands were much darker than its hair. Jeannie ordered her eldest boy to run back to the house and fetch a blanket. Two to three minutes elapsed, and the creature moved closer to Jeannie and her two other children. She told Ivan T. Sanderson that she had, quote-unquote, too much, too much time to look at it while she stood ground to protect her children. The creature was at about 100 feet away when her eldest returned with the blanket. Jeannie, wanting to block the kids from the monster's eyeline, held the blanket out in front of her, told the kids to get behind it, and she slowly backed away down to the river's edge, and then they all safely escaped into the village. She told Sanderson, I used the blanket because I thought it was after one of the kids, and so it might go into the house to look for them instead of following me. Quick thinking in a strange and terrifying situation. And it appears that the creature did enter the house while she was away. George Chapman returned from work to find the little house had been ransacked. Now, George had taken the back roads home and didn't pass through town, where he might have been stopped and told what had happened. So, But instead, he discovered his house broken into and his family missing. The woodshed had been bashed in, and a 55-gallon drum full of salted fish had been broken open, its remains half-eaten and strewn apart. Chapman also discovered large humanoid footprints around the yard, and even found hair stuck to the top of the doorway, where the creature had ducked in and brushed against the threshold to enter the house. I bet you'd like to get your hands on that hair sample, Russell. Yes. <laughs> Thankfully, George found the tracks of his wife and children that led away from the scene. Up till this point, George had never heard the term Sasquatch. And like I said, this was over a decade before the term Bigfoot had been coined. But he had heard legends of a big wild man of the mountains living in British Columbia. And when he arrived at the village, found his family who were stunned but safe... He called upon his father-in-law and a few other men from the village returned to the house to help clean up and then stand guard during the day while he was at work for the following week. Over the next couple of weeks, more tracks appeared overnight. Occasionally, the dogs that the Chapmans had brought back for protection would go wild and the Chapmans would hear weird vocalizations that sounded like gurgling whistles. 
But the Bigfoot, or whatever it was, that had made itself known to Jeannie and the kids was never seen again. The sheriff's department did come out to make casts of one of the footprints, which measured to be 8 inches wide and 16 inches long. The Chapmans were decidedly spooked and moved from that house shortly thereafter. A local paper ran the story on October 21st, 1941, but despite Jeannie being quoted as describing the creature as 10 feet tall with a human face, the article decidedly stated that what she had actually seen was just a very large bear. And that is the story of the Ruby Creek incident. Wow. Hmm. What are your thoughts here in that story, Russell? I mean, this is, I find this fascinating because it is, it does happen before the big Bigfoot phenomena. You know, I think the, you know, Albert Osman's story had happened, Ape, Ape Canyon had happened, but this is before uh, Bigfoot came around. What was the date uh, on that, Michael? 1941, yeah. September of 1941. <clears throat> wow. That's impressive. So we're talking 20 some years prior. Yeah. 26 27 well 17 years prior to uh what was it 19 1958 when the tracks show up right yeah that's right. when bigfoot was coined so that predates it by a good you know almost 20 years yeah look british columbia man i mean that is bigfoot territory mm -hmm. i mean that is like the pacific northwest almost times two uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a classic Bigfoot story, right? The, even the mm -hmm. foot, even, even the measurement of the footprints is right in line with what people are witnessing yep. today. I mean, and before people were popular, you know, making popular plaster casts or faking them, you yeah. know what I mean? Faking these steps. So what do you think, Russell, have you been in this area and, and what out of this story other than the hair, would you want, if you could go back, would you do differently? <laughs> oh man. Um, definitely, uh, well, eDNA and that sort of thing probably wasn't being collected back then, but hair no. samples, footprint casts, um, it would be, if it ransacked the house and uh, the um, the woodshed and that sort of thing, there would be more hair samples around. Yeah. I mean, and they said that this thing ripped open this giant 50 gallon drum full of fish. It was like, t it wasn't just popped up. The lid didn't just pop off. It had been ripped apart, basically like incredible Hulk style, like mm. pried open. Nice. Nice. It's like me in a bag of Oreo cookies. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> More glimpses into <laughs> pandemic life. <laughs> that would be, you know, I would love to, to get my hair, samples from those guys and have a look at those yeah. i'd love to have a look at the um the, a cast of the footprint i wonder where that evidence would be that's only 60 some years ago right yeah the so, i'm now i don't know what happened to the 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 cast itself but the in the article and i'll put again i can find this photo and put it up the article had um and the newspaper article they they had a tracing of the cast next to like a tracing of a regular footprint. So it's pretty low fi um, oh. evidence, well, but I don't know. So this had I, this hair and this stuff had to go somewhere. I was going to say, I mean, I can tell you if I, if those, if Ivan T Sanderson got a hold of those foot casts, then there's a good chance that Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum has them because I believe uh, Dr. Sanderson gave most, uh, most, of, I don't No, He wasn't a doctor, but uh, Sanderson gave most of his collection to Jeffrey. Meldrum. I don't think he has it though, because he, he didn't interview the family, the mm. Chapman family, until for night until 19 years later. Interesting. Oh. And a sad, sad thing that I just thought was, you know, one of these spooky notes that we always talk about, Bryce. Yeah. Um, weird, weird and tragic. All three children ended up dying. Uh, I think two of them drowned later, and one of them died of the fever. And then shortly after they told this story to Sanderson, uh, the husband and wife, I think, both died in an accident, like a oh car accident. God, right. So it's wow. so weird. What a spooky. <sighs> yeah. That the whole family died tragically after all of this happened in the like following 20 years. Yeah, it's hard not to, after hearing a story like that and the, what happens afterwards, to sort of mythologize it as, as, as having some supernatural power, you know, <laughs> right, it's like you, you want, it's, it's like no wonder where we get some of these outlandish theories that <clears throat> people like me like to uh, spouse around. But uh, 
yeah, pretty interesting, man. Well, I will say this, Russell, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. You are just such an incredible guy. It's been so great getting to know you, not just as like a, a team member of Expedition Bigfoot, but as just a regular guy and a friend, man. We, I think I think we all can say we really respect you, man, and, and think you're really cool, dude. Um, you know, I will tease that, uh, you know, just like last year when, you, you know, when we showed that thermal video, it wasn't till the end episode where we get to see how Russell took that and got that. Um, and so there's more on that footprint that Russell finds in that teaser from Man, the first episode. Wait, wait till wait. you get there. It'll Russell, fucking blow your mind. I, I don't know how you keep your cool, man. Does anything scare you out in those woods? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you will you will see that I you, well, actually, just this latest episode. Um, it's nothing like what you're going to see later in the next few episodes. But um, when the lightning struck, mm-hmm. that was it's funny because I remember that that moment so clearly because the lightning was it sounded like a shotgun directly over my head and you hear the sound you see the light flash in my and I jump all this on that last episode it was just it was so spontaneous and so wickedly loud it scared the crap out of me I'm glad uh, I'm glad we moved on from that scene quickly <laughs> I, I will it. say that that your example of, of you being scared, you immediately following that, you said, "Well, that's a little too close for my comfort," and then just <laughs> just calmly took action. Yeah. So that's, that's you scared. <laughs> so you're doing pretty <laughs> good. I don't know how you do it, man. Uh, I'll never. I'll, I know this. I'm 42. I will never be half the man you are, Russell. It's not going to happen. R- Riley, Michael, I think we need to all head out into our backyards with a large knife just to yeah. just to experience some. <laughs> Uh, some of what russell went through so great uh <laughs> russell we don't know where to find bigfoot exactly but where can our listeners find you and your work um i actually i have a couple books that i have on amazon um great. if you just look up my name russell acord i have a couple books and i don't know if you guys have ever had time to read them we haven't, but I'm well familiar the bitter the bitter root uh, bigfoot book series uh it's, it's on bitter, my bitter. list of reading man i've got and to check them out Add the, if you're listening and you're keeping track of book recommendations, I know a few of you are, uh, Librarian Rachel, I'm thinking of you, add these to the list. I will put um, a link to both of these books in the show notes as well, so people can go directly to them and, and to Russell's website um, so you can pick them up. Um, anything else other than Expedition Bigfoot on Discovery Plus to plug? Yes, um, Corridor 13. Oh, great. Okay. What's yeah, that? I, I actually, if you, if I, a very good friend of mine, Bob Gimlin, is actually uh, on this. This uh, I, I actually manage some talent that goes to conferences and speaks about Bigfoot or high strangeness and that sort of thing. And I have a website called Corridor Thirteen dot com, and you can you can see like Ronnie LeBlanc is on there, Bob Gimlin. Yeah. Um, I got uh, there's a, there's a couple pretty cool names on there. When you look, you'll see what I'm talking about. Maddie Blake is on there. Um, Rocco from the Mayans MC is on there. Um, you just uh, just a nice place to go see whatever you know. What other people have to to offer? But I believe that if you uh, I'm on on there as well, and I think that my books. Um, there's a link to my books on there as well. So Great. I'll throw that up there. And finally, before we started recording, we were talking about that really cool Bigfoot action figure that you carry around on your backpack. Where can I get that? We call him Scout because he's directly behind me and we say he's got your six. So he's watching behind you. Um, CreatureReplica.com. And if you go on that quarter 13, you'll see Jeff Byers is one of the guys on quarter 13. Um, and he actually has a link to Creature Replica, and you can get Scout off of his site. He's actually the guy who gets them manufactured and brought into the United States, and he goes all over the place and delivers them. And I'm telling you, this is a very, very tough, sturdy action figure, and they're solid and just about unbreakable. Wow. I, I'm for sure getting these. Bryce, you have them? You and your I son have a have... couple, yeah. We have the Yeti and the Scout. And Mike, you oh, need man. one so that they can haunt your Star Wars characters. Yes. There you I'm go. I'm going to put them in my cantina. <laughs> All right, everybody. You can find us at Bigfoot Collectors Club at Instagram uh, and uh, Bigfoot Pod on Twitter. Um, 
I'm going to throw up the links to all this stuff. Dirty Picture cover up for Bryce, the 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 link to pre-order the new Spin Drift album for Riley, that'll all be up there. Please do us a favor, go to Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star review. If you do, we'll read it on the show like this one. It helps get the 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 show to new listeners. This person, Christine, wrote love. I five stars. I love 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 everything about this podcast. I I look forgot the new episodes every week. And I've even gone back and re-listened to all the past episodes. Great job, guys, and keep them coming. I'm not sure what that typo was, but we appreciate the sentiment. Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, please uh, go over there and and follow suit. We would appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thanks again to Russell Acord for joining us. Thank you, uh, Thanks. You're a blast. And um, maybe we can get the whole band together over on the other side after this whole season's done, because I didn't even get to ask you what I thought you thought think orbs are. So we'll have to save that question for later. <laughs> How we awesome. Totally. Yeah, that's for later. All Thank right, you all, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to our listeners, good night and go get regressed. Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.